bridge is still in their hands. Maybe they're going to be challenged with six people short. So that means well, let's go ahead and start. We've given a little break. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. announcement regarding public notice of the meeting. Notice of the time and place of these committee meetings was publicized by notifying the area news media, updating the OPD website, and by mailing such notice to each of the district directors on November 8, 2013. Additionally, a copy of the open meetings law and copies of the agendas for today's meetings are available for inspection. We'll begin with our committee reports, starting with finance and direct cap. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, one board item and five reporting items this month. First, uh, uh, a board item is going to be uh, a, a resolution to authorize uh, regulatory accounting treatment for, for major plant production outages uh, that are subject to outages. The costs exceed. Well, well, major plant production outages are our power station outages. The costs exceed normal uh, operations by five million dollars or more. OPD is currently accounting policies to estimate and accrue these costs in advance of the outage. This method levelizes expenses for outages in non-outage years with related rate impact to customers. Uh, staff research indicates that that current practice is no longer considered appropriate accounting. Uh, methodology or industrial practice, and this change would allow us to basically uh, finance the, the expense after the outage for instance. Does anyone have any more questions about it? Uh, it's just, you're not a, not a big money, it's just a little bit different. So this way the people that actually pay for the outage are the people that benefit from it. Because they're the yeah. customers that, you know, the new, the way we get, the that's the benefit, yeah, so. Yeah, that, that's kind of how we should do it. Yeah. It may be more fair. Yeah. <laughs> What's the time period of the regulatory accounting for each outage? Is it how many months of that? It depends on the on the station and the type of the outage. If, for example, if it's a refueling out of the Fort Calhoun station, then it would be amortized over the following 18 months of the outage. If it's an outage at one of the fossil plants that qualifies for this treatment, that you would look at the nature of that outage and look at the benefit provided by that outage and then determine the, the period of time. Okay, our next item is the uh, third quarter report for our return plan performance. Um, as of uh, September 30th, 2015, the retirement fund's market value was $855 million or $819 million at the end of the quarter. The total plan return was 4.6% uh, for the quarter. Uh, and then as of the uh, beginning of September, the uh, uh, asset allocation divided 54.9% equity, 45.1% fixed income. This is within the uh, policy guidelines that the board has approved. You'll see the um, attachments how it goes to the individual uh, uh, funds has performed. And on the first page, you see uh, how they perform by, by sector. And uh, we've been pretty well for this quarter, so you know, but generally speaking, the uh, market most of the capital. Is this a percentage we have in bonds right now? 45. 45. Yeah. Yeah. What is our uh, goal? Is it 60, 40, 55, 45? It's about 55, 45, but there's a range around that. Now, it used to be 60, 40. But under the new policy, there's a range. The reason for that is that if you get into some type of unusual market situation, you wouldn't want to have to sell off and capture losses because of the market. So if there's a little bit of flexibility. If you didn't have flexibility, you'd, you'd be constantly making the new If you wanted to follow the letter of the rule. And, and sometimes you'd be doing it in the worst possible time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next reporting item is part of the uh, legal fees for the third quarter. We have our, our bill from our, our, our general counsel, Freddie Stryker. We also have uh, a report from our special counsel, GKG, for servicing the manager for a full presentation. The next one is with uh, Robin Sanders, uh, for servicing related to uh, environmental regulations monitoring. And the final one is with uh, the Spawn. The 
next uh, item is the, uh, it's an annual report of, of the various uh, organizational membership extensions we have this year past. Uh, and this is attached. Uh, there doesn't appear to be anything new this year. Um, we, why have we decided to keep the U.S. Yeah, for, for, for 2014, we kept the class C membership, which is a portion of that fee. And then for 2014, we'll reevaluate with the cybersecurity and the Fukushima initiative, which we started with USA. And we'll probably stay with Fukushima, uh, with the modifications of the spent fuel, the lab notification that we talked last month. Uh, we'll, we'll look to see where the right jump off point is. But uh, I would expect in 2015, we'll neck that down further. We'll probably keep the Class C membership as just a, uh, I'll say it's kind of a bargaining chip for just uh, an additional opportunity uh, for purchasing and you know, purchasing opportunities. We'll see if we think it'll pick this up. We'll do a nice report from USA that would class C. Okay. It has decreased from half yeah, and also we had a full-time equivalent that was supporting that also from this age and that uh, we're no longer doing that, so we should also have substantial amount of savings from that too. We'll see the attachment to use that should be Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Capital expenditures for the month was a $15 million, which is 
for about 15 to 22 percent on your budget. Your in capital expenditures uh, uh, is about 3.2 million uh, under budget, about 3.3 percent. Your cash balance in of October, 276.4 million dollars, which was about 32 million dollars under budget. Cash balance that excludes 14.1 million dollars distributed from the rest of the city to.
a little bit also in our NRC uh, Triangle Force on Four Security Drills uh, this month, in this past month too, uh, that were very successful. As mentioned, uh, really minimal impact from the government shutdown. Uh, we, we, we were able to process and receive an exigent license amendment request uh, that aligns our licensing basis with the work that we're doing to improve our high energy line break. And as I mentioned, uh, those modifications really are the last major work that we have uh, before plant startup. Uh, we also did receive a work hour rule exemption that we're using judiciously, primarily with operations and some of our select maintenance uh, folks as we finished up the work window. As mentioned, the NRC 0350 Operational Readiness Assessment Team was on site the week of October 28th. Other round the clock operations for several days, and the overall conclusion was that FCS can be operated safely, uh, as well as we did get some, some good improvement opportunities uh, from that round the clock observations. I mentioned the security force on force, three for three uh, successful exercises, and so we look at security in total this year, you know, with the amount of work that we've done, uh, a lot of fleet support. Uh, the first item that we closed on the 350 panel, as well as uh, wrapping up the year uh, with security force on force. Uh, we also had a uh, ERO, emergency response organization, uh, exercise dress rehearsal last week. If you remember from the wins that we had, uh, we've got the rescheduled actual uh, NRC inspection of that the first week in December. And as we talk at the station, you look at the operational readiness, you look at the security, you look at the emergency plan. And really three foundational elements for safe operations. So as mentioned, uh, we're expecting to see today uh, notification. I didn't see it yet on the website this morning, so I'm looking at you. Uh, the public meeting that the NRC will have on 1121. Uh, in parallel with that, we are submitting today our integrated restart report, which really embodies all of the work that we've done under manual chapter 350 and is our own really declaration of the plans ready for restart. Uh, a number of additional items closed uh, over the uh, over the past couple weeks uh, with the manual chapter 0350 panel, the M2 contactor flood recovery plan system help, geotechnical, uh, the maintenance processes, as well as operational readiness as mentioned. Uh, other major activities, uh, next week we have our maintenance and technical training info accreditation visit. I mentioned the ERO evaluated exercise, and then uh, in the background <coughs> we're finalizing uh, our integrated site implementation schedule, which is Basically, the foundation for integration into the fleet that will get approved on December 12th. And that's really the foundation for our, uh, for our going forward plan for sustaining improvement. Any questions? That's the big picture at Fort Cal State for the last week. Any questions? Can you get us Sure, I'll, uh, I'll give a brief, uh, non technical report. Uh, I will not cover any, any of the topics that uh, we'll cover, but obviously we've made a lot of progress in the last month, and uh, it's been really, really uh, good. Uh, nuclear Oversight uh, has completed over 200 inspections with satisfactory results. Uh, we've also completed over 100 productive maintenance activities and uh, some modification to packages or abuse. Uh, nuclear Oversight continues to monitor resolutions to concerns that I've mentioned before and uh, we're working with the stations on those, but I may want to mention that none of those uh, concerns is safety related. Uh, I'll mention just a few of those, just to give you an, an idea on what I'm talking about. Uh, one would be management needs to ensure that all aspects of readiness are complete prior to process implementation. Uh, for example, uh, maintenance lockdowns are not always performed and sometimes are not effective at uh, identifying problems that could cause uh, work delays. Uh, so these consequences of the inadequate, <coughs> in, inadequate uh, lockdowns, delayed work, uh, into issues that could have been resolved before we start the work. Uh, another one would be operations management uh, needs to enforce documenting condition reports. Uh, another example would be we've had some unexpected switchyard open gate alarms. Uh, one occurred in September, late September. Uh, one occurred, uh, occurred in October uh, 4th. Uh, those should have generated condition reports and uh, uh, that document exactly what happened and when. Those were not done. Uh, a third and last one I would uh, want to mention, uh, Fort Calhoun has made some improvement, <coughs> some improvement to the engineering's corrective action uh, program. Uh, and I have mentioned that a couple times before. Uh, but uh, nuclear oversight believes that the behaviors to improve the organization's effectiveness 
uh, remains unsatisfactory. I think we've made a lot of progress, but we still feel uh, <coughs> there is room to, uh, to improve there. So we continue to monitor that, and, and again, uh, none of those is safety uh, related Did issues. Work, sir? Yeah, some paperwork, some some uh, some ownership behaviors, and, and those again, none of them is safety related, but they do cause delay in work. And, and, and you know the little more right, right. And, and, and the idea here is to drive the station toward excellence. It's not, it's not just uh, satisfactory. We need to drive the station to excellence. <coughs> uh, and the last thing I want to mention: the nuclear oversight has completed an independent review uh, of the station readiness to restart and concluded that we already restart the plant. Any questions? Any questions? The officers were there when uh, security force on force were, was going on, and, and uh, uh, when they got all done, they were in the cafeteria, just part of them, but it was pretty impressive. Pretty impressive group. And, uh, uh, you can see the enthusiasm, and uh, they were really pleased with how it went. So that was, uh, it is a big force. <laughs>
including collective bargaining agreements. We've made great progress with union negotiations, thanks to cooperation with the unions uh, and getting to those negotiations. And we made changes to uh, make it better for the position, both for the union and for ourselves. This is something we haven't talked about a lot before, but we did get the top ranked list electric utility brand at eSource. And what that means is that our brand is strong and one which consumers identify with. We believe that's because uh, the voice of our customers is positive and it's the primary element that we use when we judge this. So that, that was a great honor for the team as well. That was 2013. What's ahead of us in 2014? Improve four company station regulatory category, move out of the 350 process and an operating environment and out of that uh, out, out of those particular set of regulations. Participate in the Southwest Power Pool Day 2 market. We're busy preparing for that. The transition will be in March of next year. We're using parallel operations and deployment testing to start earlier this month in November so that we can practice uh, being in that day two market. That will be a big change for us, but one we're ready for. Maintain safe and reliable uh, service. Consistent, reliable delivery of our product is key. We have the three mission elements, which is affordable, reliable, and environmentally sensitive. And reliability, as uh, many of the directors have reminded me, is key to what we're doing going forward, uh, as well as the other two. And we've done a lot to do that. We continue to respond quickly to outages when we do happen and restore those. And hand in hand with that is the ongoing focus on employee safety is having another very good year. Evolving regulations are going to be a challenge in 2014 in all elements of our business, environmental, nuclear, and transmission. We, we see <clears throat> changing regulations coming. We should know more on the, uh, with regard to greenhouse gas in June. Um, <clears throat> greenhouse gas rules are uh, promulgated in EPA. That will be a big switch for us and some big information for us to deal with. And as we say previously, at Fort Calhoun, our goal is to meet the exceeding regulations that come out. We are implementing a stakeholder process, which has been briefed before. That will be a challenge for us and an opportunity uh, in 2014. We've conducted a series of open houses. We have the stakeholder process formulated. The board has approved that stakeholder process. And we'll be using it to, to gain input in the future of our organization. And then organizational operating efficiency. All organization operating efficiencies continue to be driven through the organization, primarily using the lean manufacturing principles that some of you may be familiar with. That seeks to eliminate any process waste uh, or save, and save time and improve the quality and productivity of our system. Just to give you an example, we've redesigned our business process to be more responsive today's just in time business world. Over the last four years, the lean principles have got 7.3 million from our budget, and 215 business processes have been redesigned. We will continue to implement this in 2015 uh, for cost savings as well as efficiencies and better serving customers, both internal and external. That's the setup from 13 and setup from 14, and I'll let our CFO, Ed Easterman, cover the program in 2014.
and cooling and heating and HVAC, and we're seeing a lot of inroads to efficiency. Having said that, if we look at where we are for 2013, year to date, compared to the 2014 budget, you can see it's pretty close to 0.3%. So it's not a big change from what we're actually experiencing today. It is a change from what we forecasted for today. The next category is probably uh, a, a larger note of the assumptions, and that is if there's 0% retail rate increase projected in the budget. Uh, general rates remain unchanged, as does the rate for the fuel and purchase power adjustment. There is a change to the tariff and the methodology in the tariff that I'll cover a little bit later, but the rates themselves stay as they are today. On the wholesale side, increased sales due to a full year operation for Calvin Station increases the off system revenues. <coughs> Debt retirement reserve, uh, as mentioned earlier in the report, we transferred $17 million from that account in October. That left us with a zero balance. We're not projected to put any money into that account, and so we're projected to be at zero at the end of 2014. Rate stabilization reserve, we got $32 million in there today. We're projected to stay at $32 million at the end of 2014. The only expenditure side, the capital and O&M, uh, we're, we're, we're planning expenditures to maintain system reliability and to serve future flow growth. Uh, the item that was discussed this morning, the action item for Thursday's meeting, the approval change is also factored in <coughs> to the budget. Production operations is, is, has a, quite a busy schedule ahead of them in 2014 with regards to planned outages. You can see that all our fossil stations have planned outages, and in addition there are a number of extended outages in our feed companies. This is a result of Number one, the normal maintenance cycle that takes place on our units. Number two, some deferred outages that have occurred in the past because of the continued or extended outage for Capital Station. We have to get those things done. We have to maintain the plants to maintain reliability. So you can see that it's a four year outage. Work. Taking all that together, the sales forecast, our current rates, and producing our revenue forecast. We're projecting $884 million of retail revenue in 2014. You can see the breakout there, out based on the, the stack in the bar, if you will, or the colors are, are separated there. In 2014, the residential, the blue portion of the bar, is $376 million. The green commercial, $278. Industrial is $210 and the gray. And then the brick color is $20 million for government and, and municipal. The 884 is slightly down from the 901 in 2013, and that's mainly driven by changes in the sales forecast. We always project in the budget on normal weather conditions. In other words, it's a 50% chance it's going to be colder, a 50% chance it's going to be warmer. And we don't want to take an extreme because if it doesn't happen, then we're not close to being right on the revenue and sales forecast. On the wholesale revenue side, we see improved uh, sales in the other category, the blue section of the bar at the end, 126 million compared to 48 million and 13. That's a result of having additional generation available for uh, sale into the market. The blue, the green portion of the bar is, is close, 65 versus 72. That's really NC2 participant revenues. In total, the wholesale revenue, 191 million in 2014 to 120 million in uh, 2013. The last area of revenue is other operating revenue and non operating income. We're projecting 31 million in 2014. That compares to 35 million in 13. You can see it's down considerably from 2012, where it was 60 million. The variance here is occurring in the other category, the red portion. That's really related to some insurance proceeds from the flood that we received in 2012. We also have some SPP revenues that kind of float in and out of there. The timing and such causes a little variation. That's what we're seeing in 13 and 14. <coughs> Turning to revenue, looking at our operating and maintenance expense, projecting $802 million in OM, 
2014 compared to 807. 2013. The categories are broken out down at the bottom, just like we did on the revenue. The first area, the blue portion of the bar, is fuel at 195 million. Production uh, is basically the, the conversion of that fuel into energy is 282 million. Administrative in general is 143 million. Transmission distribution, 73 million. Purchase power, 75. And customer accounts, 34. You kind of group this up and you look at total production between nuclear and production operations. It's 552 million, or 69% of the budget. The other categories, which would include T and D, A and G, and customer accounting, would be $250 million, or 31%. <coughs> Turning from OM to capital, we're projecting $173 million in, in CapEx. In 2014, same, same drill here across the bottom. 2014, uh, transmission distribution is, is projected at $79 million. Nuclear production, at $43 million. General plant, $25 million. Fossil production, $26 million. Uh, $76 million. The TD is 46% of the capital budget. Nuclear is 25%. General plant is 14. And fossil production is 15. If you group nuclear and fossil together, that's 40% of the budget. Looking at some of the capital programs and projects included in this expenditure. The first area is nuclear regulatory compliance of 13 million. That's a security upgrade related work and some initial work with Fukushima. Second category is Nebraska CD1 air preheater basket replacement, <coughs> 4 million. We have some nuclear containment internal structure work, pre work uh, for the upcoming outage of 15, uh, 5 million. Nebraska, <coughs> excuse me. Sarkin County 3 unit overhaul is <coughs> 4 million and the pipeline is 2 million in Nebraska City. And looking at the T and D area, we have a functional work of 22 million. Uh, the TDIP program, transmission distribution improvement program, is 12 million. And then customer related projects, 16. This is where we're adding additional capacity to serve new customers or expanding service for existing customers. Looking at the capital program, our available uh, working capital and revenues throughout the period, we are not projecting a bond issue for new money purposes in 13 or 14. Not to mention we could have refundings, but at this point we're not projecting a new money issue. Pulling it all together into an income statement, we're projecting that income of 2014 to 56 million all from base sources, in other words, we're not using any of the rate stabilization reserve to achieve that, and we don't have any of the debt retirement funds available. You can see those uh, contributions that have been made there in the past. Speaking of our funds, basically our savings account, we're not including debt retirement funds in 13 or 14, we are maintaining the rate stabilization reserve. Looking at our capital structure, this is basically how do we finance our, our assets, what does our balance sheet look like. In 2014, we're projected to have 51% debt ratio. That's improved from 53% in 2012. Our target on this is 50%. We're working our way back down to the 50% uh, range. Turning from debt ratio into debt service coverage, <coughs> we have three coverage ratios that we look at. The first one, the top line, the blue line, is for senior lien debt service. The green line in the middle is for total debt service. And then the red line is, the third line is for fixed charge coverage. Now these are very important metrics for the rating agencies and also for investors. This basically tells us how much cash flow we have available to pay our, our mortgage payments, our debts, 
and to find capex. <coughs> so for example, if you look at the green line and we show 2.0 times, what that says is after we pay our operating and maintenance expense, we have enough money available to pay our total debt service, seemingly and subordinately, two times. So we can make that payment once, and then we have an equal amount available to fund capital. That's important because we are not uh, shareholder owned. We can't generate equity by selling stock. We generate equity by funding capital from our own cash for revenues and repayment of debt. Days cash on hand, we are projected to be above 100 days in uh, 2013 and 14, and our, our target or our minimum is 100 days. We do have one period in 2014 when we come very close to being below 100 days. In May, right now, based on our forecast, we're coming right down to that 100-day mark. We'll have to wait and see what happens during the year, but we do have a line of credit behind us that's not included in the 100 days if we need to pull on something there. Uh, the board has retained a consulting engineer, a firm, to review the budget on behalf of the board. New Gen Strategies and Solutions has uh, been in the, the building, uh, conducted meetings, interviews, and walked through the various components of the budget. They will be providing a report to the board prior to the December meeting to basically state their, their understanding and whether they recommend approval of the budget. Just a note that New Gen is uh, a new firm. <coughs> the, the, the people working at New Gen used to work with SAIC, they have kind of moved off in, in a new direction. And just so you have some history there, SAIC used to be part of the Fed. So, a lot of name changes here. In summary, the mission is to provide affordable, reliable, environmentally sensitive energy services to our customers. The 2014 corporate opportunity plan is aligned with this mission. Rates remain below the regional and national average, and expenditures are sufficient to maintain system reliability. 16.2% of our energy will be provided by renewable resources, energy, and plant milk gas. Also, we continue to um, look for OM uh, efficiencies, prioritize and managing our capital investments, and in managing the risk. So that's when I have prepared the corporate operating plan, I can answer any questions you have, or we can go straight into the electric service Okay, Any questions? We discussed earlier the fuel and purchase power adjustment. Um, that rate was uh, put into place, I believe, in 2009, anticipated in 2009, implemented in 2010. It basically, uh, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. Our fuel cost is generally included in our general rates. And then the fuel and purchase power adjustment is a mechanism to allow us to collect any projected fuel cost that is in excess of what's in our general rates or reduce the rates so that we don't overflow. So it is a, it is a true up mechanism. And we look forward each year in the budget and we say, what is our fuel cost in the next year and how does that compare to what's in our general rate? And based on that, we adjust that fuel and purchase power. The one change we'd like to make in um, 2014 is a change in the tariff. And the change is really around including consumables in the calculation we have here today. Now, consumables are chemicals and material that's used directly in the production of electricity. So an example would be lime down at Nebraska City on some of the environmental equipment. Uh, chemicals used for water treatment would be another. The, the reason this is important is because of the variable cost it varies with the production of electricity, and it also aligns with the, the methodology that will be used in the day two market with SPP. So we will be pricing energy for sale of SPP, and that energy price will include consumables. What we're trying to do is align that same pricing methodology up with our regional rates so 
that we can see the same prices in both both customer classes and staff and focus and, and maintain the view on one single uh, price. It also does a better job of matching revenues for the expenses. So that's that's the change that we would propose. Um, in addition, we have uh, a true up from 2013 of about $49 million of under collection. This under collection is a result of the extended allergy for cow station. Purchase power that we have been buying to replace the energy that would have been produced before capitalization has been a, a reported as receivable. And that calculation, this calculation, FEPA pulls that under collection in. We're proposing to spread that over three years, and this would provide that we would collect 23 million of that 49 million dollars in 2014. The remaining balance would be collected over the years 2015 and 16. The good news here is we can include the consumable cost, we can collect the 23 million and not change the existing fuel purchase power rate. Just a high level summary, I mentioned earlier the fuel is included in general rates, you can see that there are 180.8 million, we include 23 million in, and the rate for FEPA is 0 0.00215, which is uh, no change from the current rate. Other changes, we have some tariff uh, revisions and changes we'd like to also propose. We look at consumer service charges. We have a service drop, duck, and co-lot charge. That's kind of what we said. I'm not sure what I really want to say, but I have to really focus on it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little focus here. Today, when, when new subdivisions go in and we, we connect service, the developer the builder pays for the difference of putting in underground service versus overhead. And that's about an $880 a lot charge. This would add to that with, with a fee associated with putting in a duct. A duct is basically a conduit that is in the ground that allows the electrical cable to provide power to the home. And the, the benefit of this is in the future, if the cable fails and it has to be replaced, you can just pull the new cable through that duct and not have to go and disturb the landscape and, I guess, customer property. It adds, I believe, an additional $300. It's about $780. And this is for new, new bond projects going into the future. The next item are reconnect charges, so when customers are disconnected, non-payment or other reasons and then they want to be reconnected there's a charge to go back out there today we have a two-tiered structure if the work occurs during working hours normal working hours is $55 if it's after hours it's $120 so what staff is proposing is to have one fee of $75 and that apply whether it's during work hours or after hours Edward can I just add something yes. on the I'm sorry about interrupting um, uh, just a couple things. This is really on uh, new SIDs. Um, so the new SIDs would require that the builder would install ducts from the pedestal to the home. Um, and, and the ducts would be under certain requirements that, that we would um, require them to, to do that. We have met with the SID developers and the builders on that. We're changing the SID agreements to reflect that. Um, to be effective uh, January uh, 1. Um, the other component of that is the lot charges. What we found as we were going through this um, review is that $880 typically uh, included most of the infrastructure in a development, except it didn't include the service line itself. And so that charge will go from around $880 to about $1,180 to reflect the actual cost including some of the increased costs that we've seen in material and, and equipment and, uh, and labor and, and those pieces around that. So it has both of those pieces um, in that lot charge and then the requirement of ducts for, for new SIVs. Um, and then after 2014, we're working with the builders and developers on existing SIVs and existing lots that are still out there and how we might address those in the future. And Mo and I will come back and, and present something to the board after the first of the year on that. 
we can't seem to come to an agreement with the builders and developers on, on that component. Um, so we're going to let this sit, come back in January after we have enough things done. If, if you particularly um, concerned with tenant, I guess, uh, you know, the previous city administration took a lot of heat over uh, issues, issues in the planning, the planning department, specifically dealing with developers, and uh, as far as being the work with, mm -hmm. does that kind of cause any, any Well, this is, is what I guess, or is yeah, they certainly would like us just to do the way we've done it before. But what we have found is, and, and what we'll share with the uh, with the board, um, is is kind of a white paper that we did. That essentially, when we go ahead and um, uh, essentially plow in a service line, there's about a million dollars a year that we spend on service lines where we have to come back in and redo maintenance, whether that's refilling, recapping, repairing, a number of different issues, and. What we're trying to do is to get out of that piece. And so when the house is being built, let that electrician or contractor put in that duct to the pedestal. Then they can do the grading and then we can pull. We'll still pull the service line and do the connections. Um, that's really important. And so what we've identified this is about a three to five hundred dollar incremental cost. But what happens today during the winter time primarily, but even during other failures, is that um, it's different than the developments. If we have a cable failure in a development, we can typically isolate it, get all the power back into the homes, and then repair that. Uh, but with the service line, that customer is out of power. And during the winter time, what we'll do is we'll connect the service to the meter, and then we'll lay it on the ground until we can actually get in and plow it in um, after that. And that creates, it, it can create some safety and some risk issues. Um, the homeowner has been very good about it, but this would alleviate that for those homes that would have those ducts in place where we can pull that new cable, make the connections there on, and we don't have to disrupt their homes, their, um, their patios, all the other issues that they build around that they're not supposed to build around, but they do. And, uh, and so um, we are sensitive to that, and that's why we're working with the builders. I, I think that's why this issue is moving forward. The existing lots and the existing SID agreements were still in conversations uh, with the builders and the developers and SID attorneys. Uh, so, uh, Tim, I'm Director Cavanaugh's question on, on several of those meetings, working with Tim on it, probably with the developers as well. And they've been very pleased with the service. That Absolutely. No problem at all. It's the cost that basically, and I think even those things, they receive benefits longer term, but again, the cost and the use of the variables. And part of their concern was we have contracts that are in place. We don't want to have to go back to the motor and increase it by 500. We understand that. That's why we're kind of delaying this until we can put together a, a strategy that we think they can live with and we can live with and, and work through that. So, what was the the, the uh, business hour and after hours cost adjustments? Was that was that on weekend charges? Was that yeah. 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 It, would that be a net gain of any kind or would that be a wash? I think this is not a wash. And I, I think it eliminates a lot of the confusion about when the work is started. So if you started during hours and you can it after hours, or when they make the call or whatever. Okay. I, I think it's kind of hard to administer yeah. during hours and after hours. Okay. The, the next item is, is very similar to that. It's a simplified customer deposit policy. Today we can look at the projected usage of a customer and we ask them to put down two months of the interview usage as a business security deposit. Um, that the recommendation there is to change that to ask each customer to account to the dollars. That's an administrative matter. It's consistent with what we see on utilities given the PPD does have and so that's SRP and Arizona so that's a recommendation. <coughs> The, the next one is uh, curtailment rates. Uh, in our policy would be revised to indicate that uh, capacity curtailments may occur when you don't have adequate operating capacity. So today, those, those capacity ratings are somewhat like paper ratings, They're saying that if you don't have capacity up to what you install, then you can make those reductions. But this is more flexible in that if we have uh, rate of a unit or we have other conditions going on, we can use the, the actual capacity we have operating. It gives us more flexibility in responding to unexpected operating uh, situations. And this really, really relates to larger customers who own the rates, uh, not programs like the air efficient program. And what, uh, what is the <coughs> uh, it depends. We, a lot of them, we do uh, background checks and credit reviews 
and, and their service fees. But it would typically be the two highest ones, deposit or surety or whatever that would look like. And, and what we're finding with customers coming in, you know, the discussion has been around, well, I'm not going to use as much as the previous customer. Typically, it's in landlord kinds of arrangements or lease arrangements. Typically, if they're buying a home, we do not require a deposit for a new homeowner that's buying a home. Uh, because that credit risk has been done only until they receive a disconnect notice or they've been disconnected to the required deposit. For those customers, typically this is a, kind of a landlord setting, which is typically our highest write-off um, for residential customers. Uh, and, and kind of the discussion we always get in from the call center reps is, well, I'm not going to use as much as the previous customer. Or and so rather than doing that, it's just going to the flat rate. So. We don't have to discuss whether or not they're going to use as much as the previous customer. And it's just a conversation that doesn't need to occur. And, and we don't have to, um, you know, kind of get into that situation with the customer. So that's why we went with the flat deposit. Uh, refresh my mind. How long do you keep that deposit then? Um, yeah, so for residential customers, I believe we keep it for two years. If they pay, by the due date for two straight years, we refund that deposit with interest. For commercial customers, it's four years. Uh, and the same parameters um, exist in that. If they pay by the due date for four straight years, we'll, ref we'll refund that deposit with interest. Um, am, I, am I right? It's okay. Very good. Just want to make sure I'm on that track. Uh, and then the only thing I would do is that in the event there's a future disconnect notice or a pass to them, uh, then we go back and uh, ask for that deposit. <coughs> so the last item is miscellaneous housekeeping changes. This is really where we're going to look at some of our tariffs and clarifying the language around the weekly holidays. <coughs> also clarifying language around uh, which rates schedules qualify for the level pay for the basic budget bill. So this is just housekeeping with some additional language. It doesn't change the tariff. It doesn't change the policy. This makes it easier for staff and what was in the first place. Um, going forward, we're here today. Uh, we've notified local media through our traditional practices about the budget and the rate projections. We would plan to make this presentation on Thursday during the board meeting and then come back in December and request approval of the corporate operating plan and the change to the deputy tariff. Uh, 
these bids, three bids were received. One bid was determined to be legally non-responsive. The engineer's estimate for this project is $7,200,000. You'll note that we're asking for authorization by the board to award a contract in the amount of $3,581,344 to Irwin Industries Incorporated. That's quite a bit under the engineer's estimate, which is rather unusual. We don't really know what that's about, except we think it may be deal with the scope of the, the difference in scope as the engineer looked at it, as he looked at it. And perhaps also to, due to a competitive labor cost. Anyway, um, the contract, as I said, is $3,581,344 to Urban Industries Incorporated, and you will note that that was in the 